Okay, I'm going to get started and kick us off. My name is Umu. I'm a fellow on the Brooklyn Klein Center's Assembly Disinformation Program. I am really excited to be joined today by two important voices at the intersection of law and technology, Evelyn Duick and Julie Ono. Evelyn is a lecturer on law and an SJD candidate at the Harvard Law School, an affiliate at the Brooklyn Klein Center, and she studies global regulation of online speech and private content moderation. Julie is an attorney and the executive director of Paris-based Internet Without Borders and a member of the Facebook Oversight Board. Thank you both Julie and uh, Evelyn for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yes. So the topic of, of our conversation today is lessons learned, particularly from the 2016 elections, which were a formative moment for platforms. Um, the manipulation of social media by various actors in 2016 presented social media companies the opportunity to learn from and think through um, how to improve and refine um, approaches to content moderation, uh, to develop functionality around assessing and addressing inauthentic behavior and other automated um, abuses of the platform, and more generally to develop a strategy and set of practices and policies to deal with disinformation. There's also been a lot of uh, fodder for lesson learning and adaptation, and adaptation since 2016, um, including the 20, 2018 midterm elections, the COVID-19 pandemic and other high interest world events. And so to begin the conversation, I'd like to have Evelyn set the stage with an overview of the major lessons learned and inflection points over the past couple of years. Um, at a high level, Evelyn, uh, what would you say are the key lessons uh, from the 2016 elections that uh, the large social media platforms had um, in terms of content moderation and, and authentic behavior in particular? Cool. So shall I jump into my... Uh, excellent. All right, let's do it. I'm going to share some slides because I am a slide addict. Okay. Um, okay, so can you see all that all right? Yes. Perfect. Um, Okay, so uh, what have we learned? What are the big lessons uh, from 2016 to 2020? Uh, we've actually come quite a long way, I think, in many respects. Um, I don't know if uh, you remember, but uh, you know, here, here, uh, one week after the 2016 election, here's Mark Zuckerberg uh, saying um, the idea that fake news on Facebook had an effect at all is a pretty crazy idea. Um, whereas now, uh, I can barely go anywhere on the internet or listen to any podcast without Facebook telling me how very seriously they are taking the 2020 election um, and everything that they're doing to make sure that uh, that it's all going to be A-OK. -okay. You know, they've made significant improvements. We're working hard to stop foreign interference. Uh, this is uh, this is not, you know, it, it's no longer crazy. This is something that's uh, absolutely front of mind. And it's not just Facebook, of course. A bunch of other platforms, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, TikTok, all of them are telling us, reassuring us, uh, they've got this guys. Um, so what does that mean? Um, well, I'm trying to keep track of what uh, platforms have been doing and all of their policy announcements, particularly in the last month, have sort of felt a bit like this, to be honest. Uh, it's sort of been like a DDoS attack of just like constant policy updates. It's been pretty full on. Um, and so I'm not going to be able to go through it uh, in, in detail, obviously. But I think we can probably say we can, we can put it into four buckets. Um, so connecting people to more information proactively. Uh, they've also rolled out a bunch of new uh, content rules. Um, we've seen some new thinking outside the take down, leave up binary, and I'll talk about that a, a bit more later. And uh, this, as Umu mentioned, you know, the coordinated authentic behavior of the foreign influence campaigns, uh, they're taking that more seriously. Now, these first two, I think, we can really sort of see in some ways as an outgrowth of what platforms did in the context of the pandemic. Um, when the when the pandemic started, this was, you know, an opportunity where it was sort of like a break glass moment. It was obviously a state of emergency. Uh, they took some fairly heavy handed uh, responses to that, um, at connecting people to World Health Organization information and local resources and rolling out a bunch of new rules about misinformation, health misinformation, and aggressively taking it down purely on the basis that it was false in a way that we hadn't really seen platforms uh, willing to do before then. And I think that was by and large a positive response 
to those efforts. And so it's sort of, uh, we've seen uh, a more emboldened approach now uh, in, in this context as well. Um, so it's interesting to, to look at that trend. Uh, what does that look like? Like I said, I can't really keep track of it all and I'm not gonna go through it now, but fortunately the Election Integrity Project, a partnership at Stanford has been doing a bang up job and especially Carly Miller, uh, give a shout out of keeping a, a track of all of these. Um, they have, you know, been showing all of the new rules that platforms have been uh, rolling out uh, to, to deal with the election around um, false claims about procedural interference or participation interference or fraud uh, in relation to um, in, to the election, and you can see here a bunch of uh, a bunch of new policies. Uh, also, um, to do with as as it became clear that delegitimization of election results was going to be a major threat, a bunch of new policies around that. If you're wondering what's keeping me up at night, uh, it's this one here. YouTube does not have a policy about what it will do for false or premature claims of election victory. Um, I don't think it's hard to see what the nightmare scenario is uh, is there, but. Um, you know, as much as I deploy the awesome power of my Twitter account, Tweety, about this and say, you need a policy on this, uh, they haven't listened. So I, 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 uh, I, I don't know what we're going to do about that, but we will see. Um, okay, so those are sort of the first two buckets of like a bunch of new rules around uh, election content and civic integrity content. Um, then we've seen a bunch of new things like labels and friction. So instead of saying, let's take down this bad stuff all the time, we're introducing a bunch of like intermediate measures and thinking outside of that purely like bad stuff comes down, good stuff stays up, uh, the, the sort of a false binary that I don't think we really need to be kept into uh, when it comes to content moderation. Uh, and so the first sort of measure in there was uh, these labels. Um, and in fact, the very first labels that we saw were uh, on in, in the context months and months back, back in May, uh, Twitter put a label on a tweet from President Trump about voting in the context of the pandemic and mail-in ballots. And that was sort of uh, a, a big explosive moment uh, for, for, for content moderation. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg went on Fox News, I think the next week or the next day and took a swipe at Twitter and said, we would never do such a thing. Uh, we will not be arbiters of truth. How could you? And then a couple of weeks later, reverse policy. Uh, and now they too are uh, deploying labels and labels are the new hot thing in content moderation. We see them in all sorts of contexts. Uh, they are the new, the new tool because they seem to walk a nice line between being censors uh, and, and, and sort of adopting a counter speech approach, right? Like the information is there, it's in the public interest interest, you might want to know that your public official is saying this and you can put, take that into account when you vote. Uh, but also we're going to make sure that we connect you to accurate information. So these are these are a tweet and a, and a post from uh, just yesterday, in fact. Um, so, uh, so those lots of lots of labels in the context of voting. Um, and then a bunch of ideas uh, around friction and this stuff gets me quite excited. I, I hope that we see a lot more thinking in this vein um, as well. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I just also want to know like how quick this is. Like these first labels were in May. Um, that's only a couple of months ago and here we are and it's so, so like I think in some ways it feels like too little too late uh, and in some ways it feels like this has been a really like rapid uh, rapid development and again so these these friction ideas uh, I think we're only at the start of thinking about this but Twitter's rolled out a bunch of things like um, when you attempt to retweet misleading information you get a prompt about it um, and then in particularly high profile uh, accounts uh, with 100 thousand plus followers or with it if something's gone viral uh, they will put a flag on it um, uh, you know acknowledging that you can't catch everything but if you catch the really high profile stuff that can have a really much bigger impact um, the idea that you know when you go to retweet something they're just going to add a little extra step in there uh, prompting you to either add commentary or think about it before you retweet it uh, to try and slow things down a little bit uh, and during the week of the election uh, they're also turning off some amplification functions I'm excited about this stuff I think this is the kind of stuff that I want to see a lot more thinking about more generally outside of the context of elections too um, it's hilarious so everyone loves friction and loves the idea of friction in theory uh, but then when it comes when it gets rolled out and it gets put into practice you know everyone's like oh my god what's Twitter doing that I have to like click an extra button to retweet something uh, and it's sort of it's like friction for thee and not for me a lot of complaints uh, about this and it's sort of uh, prompted some sass from the Twitter comms account being like literally just click one more time and you can retweet it uh, it's not such a big deal um, so I, I find that funny that maybe you know if they introduced a lot more friction maybe we would all mutiny after all um, 
Troll hunting. Um, so, you know, by contrast to Mark Zuckerberg saying, um, you know, pretty crazy idea, fake news, not a big deal. Uh, now, the, the phrase coordinating authentic behavior, which literally did not exist in 2016, uh, it was made up by Facebook in 2017, um, now is everywhere. Uh, and here's like a bunch of uh, posts from Facebook about all of the coordinated inauthentic behavior that they're taking down and have taken down recently. And we get these updates uh, constantly from Facebook and the other platforms about all the trolls and, and things that they have found. Uh, never, not, not high, they, they're catching them now before they get significant engagement uh, is the, is the story and um and so you know they're being much more successful on this front and furthermore um there's a lot more cross industry collaboration and coordination with government in finding this stuff and we hear a lot of stories about how the intelligence community uh tipped off the platforms about certain uh certain influence campaigns and that prompted them to take them down and those kinds of avenues of communication that just weren't open um open in in 2016 and, and have really sort of been uh, uh have, have grown in the past couple of years we have absolutely no insight into this we have no idea what they're talking about what information they share how effective it is anything like that this is something i like am concerned about i i don't i think it's very problematic for accountability and transparency um but you know uh they release these press statements uh, and people tend to find them fairly comforting, apparently, um, that they're all working together and taking it very seriously. Uh, so it all sounds awesome. All this stuff sounds uh, incredible. Uh, as usual, though, with platforms, um, the thing is like a policy can look great on paper, but the question is, will they and can they enforce it? And I think, uh, you know, there's certainly historical uh, and recent, like historical is in historical in the context of content moderation being like the last couple of years, uh, examples of ineffective enforcement of policies. Uh, like like you could have an excellent hate speech policy or an excellent, uh, you know, incitement to violence policy, um, but if you just don't have um, the resources and aren't dedicating sufficient attention to it, uh, does it does it really matter? Uh, and that's going to be the, the big question. The other one with like labels, for example, we've seen is you can have a policy that we will label something, but if it doesn't get applied for a couple of hours and the tweet or the post has already gone viral and been seen by hundreds of thousands of people, uh, it's almost not it's almost not much better than not enforcing it at all. Um, we have seen improvement on that front. Uh, it's literally, you know, there's a few accounts, maybe one, um, that it would be great if they could keep an eye on and uh, try and enforce uh, against pretty quickly. Um, and again, like yesterday, it was much, much quicker than the sort of three or four hours that we saw uh, even a month ago. So uh, progress, I guess. Um, but we will see, we will see what happens in the next, um, in the next week or so. Um, just acknowledging the elephant in the room, and I can't do this on a Berkman Klein panel without sort of uh, acknowledging the, the resources about this. I've just spent 10 minutes talking about content moderation as if it's really important and all these rules are really important. And I do think that they are, and I do think that platforms have a lot of responsibility here and, and need to do a lot better. Uh, but at the same time, content moderation is a fairly limited lever to pull uh, in these circumstances when the president is, uh, is the one um, tweeting out or posting uh, disinformation and misinformation about va ballots and voting. Uh, processes um, and we certainly see that you know kind of no matter what the platforms do in a sense uh, this is one of the defining articles of this era for me uh, Kevin Roos termed it the president versus the mods like no matter what the platforms do the president seems to be finding ways to like push the boundaries and find the gray areas and the ambiguities uh, and try and like set up this uh, this um, dichotomy and this uh, sort of conflict between them, this story about bias against about uh, bias against conservatives and things as well. Um, and so, you know, building on important research uh, released by our colleagues here um, earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, uh, showing that, um, you know, the, the social media component of a lot of this is really secondary to the president and the, the way that that gets picked up in the mass media um, and, and Fox News and that uh, right wing ecosystem uh, has has a very large, uh, a very large effect. So um, Content moderation, important, uh, uh, they need to do much better. Platforms have a huge amount of responsibility here, um, but also is always gonna be somewhat a limited lever to pull uh, when there are massive other institutional failings. Um, and keeping that, uh, with that sort of background in mind, I think the New York Post story uh, of a couple of weeks ago uh, is, a, is a good example of this where there was a story uh, about um, a, a, a 
laptop with potentially hacked and leaked uh, emails of Hunter Biden. I'm not going to go into the underlying story, but what was interesting was that the platforms reacted fairly quickly uh, in this case, uh, seeming to want to avoid the appearance of 2016 all over again. Uh, Facebook came out and said, we have downranked this story across, it's eligible for fact checking, we've downranked it across our platform. Uh, Twitter took a more nuclear option and said that it was blocking any URLs at all. Um, it's still not entirely clear. So it's still not entirely clear what Facebook did at all, on what basis it decided to downrank it, how much it downranked it, um, why it decided uh, that it was false. But it seemed to be like an exceptional move that it was making, um, and and so that's interesting. Uh, Twitter it was didn't explain its decision initially. Then it appeared to be a fairly straightforward application of its rule about against posting personal information, which we can talk about more if uh, if we want to. Um, but then when people got outraged about that, it sort of flip-flopped on that and um, it, it created this thing where it's like you have these policies but you're not sticking to them and you're not applying them and you're, you're um, moving away from them uh, in, in, in certain circumstances. Now a lot of people have praised platforms quite a lot for their actions that they took here, quick responses and sort of prevented this from becoming a big story. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that they you know also created this second meta-narrative that we're seeing play out against uh, bias against conservatives and the fact that they departed from their uh, policies in these particular cases. And so what I would really like to see over the coming weeks is really uh, the, the platforms should like tie themselves to a mast and say, here are our policies and try and stick to them as much as possible and, and avoid the siren calls of um, public outrage or sort of uh, yeah, or, or literal telephone calls from candidates or otherwise uh, that pressure them into taking responses. Because I think that, you know, otherwise we run out, run, run into a situation where you can win the battle um, of a certain piece of information potentially uh, blocking blocking that, but you could lose the war of this idea of like creating trust in the information ecosystem more generally and the idea that here is the playing field, here are our rules, here's what we're going to do, and we're going to apply them. Now, I do acknowledge that that's going to have some, some like there's going to be some bad edge cases and some hard calls. And so, for example, just this morning, uh, we can see this. Uh, former Attorney General Holder uh, tweeted out, it's too late to use the mails um, in given the Supreme Court's decision yesterday uh, about um, what votes will be counted. Uh, and Twitter flagged this as potentially misleading. Now, taking literally, uh, it's too late to use the mails is in breach of Twitter's civic integrity policy. Um, and I think, you know, this is a hard call. Reasonable minds can differ about what Twitter should do here. Uh, what I'm saying is like, it, it's a fairly uh, robust application of its policy and that, you know, the, the, uh, Eric Holder could retweet, a, uh, could tweet another clarification of what he meant. Um, and that maybe erring on the side of rigid application of the rules is going to, in the long run, be better than platforms getting too sort of uh, steeped in subjective judgments about intention of tweeters and, and, and things like that. But that's a hard call, and I'm sure many people will disagree with me there. Um, and I'm just going to close by saying all of this is excellent. Um, and we've seen a lot of mobilization around the US election, um, but I think it's summed up by this tweet here. Uh, Indian election will create a hashtag, the US election, the whole world can't use the retweet button. Um, there's a real thing here, like a, the rest of the world's watching this going, hold on, um, what about us? And when will we get uh, similar kinds of, of measures um, as well? So uh, that is basically high level, uh, what we've, we've seen in the last month or so. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for setting the stage um, as comprehensively as you did. I want to pick up, uh, before moving on, I want to pick up on one of your key points in, in your opening, which is about labeling. Um, it's sort of, as you mentioned, a good um, non-binary option uh, within sort of the tool toolkit of content moderation that uh, sort of centers on a leave up, take down um, paradigm. How effectively in the past have you seen um, labeling work to bolster um, public confidence in the, inf in the information ecosystem? This is just such a great question, right? Like we are so, at the, like, like I said, it started in May and we are just in the very earliest days of like 
experimenting with these options and we just don't know whether whether any of them work we need independent research uh to, to see like what are the effects of these labeling options you know and and we've sort of seen like uh, platforms experimenting with like well what if we make it this color as opposed to this color like it used to be blue and now it's going to be red and like does that make a significant difference we have no idea um but it all makes us feel a little bit better that oh they put a label on that so we're good right like it's i think we have these like intuitions about what platforms should do and what makes a difference um but like they could be completely wrong. Um, so as a, you know, to your question, we don't know. Have these had effects? Have they increased people's, uh, you know, um, like do people have more and better information? I don't know. And I hope that there's a lot more research about that in the future. Thank you. Okay. I want to now turn to Julie, um, who's a member of the Facebook Oversight Board. Um, and sort of the perspective setting question I have uh, for you, Julie, is, um, can you talk a little bit about to the extent to which we can extrapolate lessons learned um, in the US since 2016 to other um, institutional and democratic contexts? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Umu, and hello, everyone. Thanks to the Berkman Klein for the invitation. I will share my screen. Uh, I don't have a very thorough presentation. It was mostly to help me uh, keep track of my speech because I talk a lot and can derail. Good morning again. Hello. Um, so uh, I think I think um, indeed the, it's it's really a, a good time to talk about the lessons learned and um, and uh, uh, Evelyn has you know clearly explained what what we could take what we could have taken uh, from the 2016 experience. Um, I, I like you said I I'm currently one of the the members the inaugural members of the uh, the Facebook oversight board which was launched in in May and has recently announced starting uh, taking cases uh, so I think the, the the oversight board is probably one of those um, you know solutions or at least has has catalyzed some of the conversations around uh, this big realization after the 2016 election that you know platforms do have a huge impact on our expression and particularly the political and even the electoral uh, conversation and expression. So um, that, but that said, despite the fact that it has been you know mentioned as uh, or it has been part of discussions around, you know, how we could make things better. Uh, uh, contrary to, you know, what probably many expect, uh, the probably the, the the oversight board is definitely not here to to be a judge in, not in any way of the US election. But rather, I think what's interesting and what will be interesting in the future is that uh, we've seen uh, Evelyn present all these uh, interesting policies. Uh, and, and, and th there is debate, you know, you were asking recent, uh, I mean, a few minutes ago, whether or not labeling does make a difference or even, but the question the board, for instance, could ask is does labeling, you know, respect is proportionate to respect, proportionate enough to respect freedom of expression, because ultimately that's, that's what all these policies are about, uh, about, you know, giving less visibility to uh, speech that could create Havoc hey, uh, and and you know chaos outside of the of the of the platforms, uh, but at the same time not limiting freedom of expression in general. Um, so yes, I think the 2016 has shown us we needed uh, more more clarity, and um, and hopefully the the oversight board will will do that in general again, um, um, bringing bringing more clarity to the discussions around uh, content moderation speech and the boundaries that the boundaries sorry that we set to to our speech on, on social media platforms um, one one thing it, which is worth noting is that uh, although I'm sure you're aware uh, we have a process uh, I mean we can re re we can be referred cases by Facebook and by users whose content has been taken down and although there is you know uh, a normal period of 90 days for us to make a decision. Um, nevertheless, there are possibilities of expedited, expedited reviews, sorry, uh, including one very ex uh, expedited review, um, which uh, has been worked on by our co-chairs uh, at the Oversight Board, which would allow us to make a decision in seven days. So theoretically, 
uh, in, in a normal process, we wouldn't be able to make any decisions directly in the aftermath of the, the presidential election, uh, the US presidential election. Um, but in, in practice, there is the existence of this expedited review uh, process. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if we, we would use it, but this is something we would have to, to discuss uh, depending on the, the criteria we set, and obviously the, 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 the imminence of the threat that the, the, the set content poses to, uh, out the, to the offline world will certainly be uh, very determinant for us to use this type of expedited review process. So uh, yes, I think it was worth noting uh, to kind of, you know, uh, uh, suit the, the disappointments among many who have expressed that, you know, the board wouldn't make any decision. Yes. 19 days, 90 days would not allow to make us a decision, would not allow us to make a decision uh, in the aftermath of the election, but there is this expedited review process, which is out there. So we'll see if it's used or not. Um, so back to back to the, the solutions uh, uh, that, you know, the recent policy developments that platforms have put out. Um, I, I think that Plenty examples uh, uh, that Evelyn mentioned. I also uh, read the, the excellent work done by uh, Mozilla, also who has tried to um, uh, to, to make a research uh, and to assess basically uh, all the policies that have been rolled out by platforms uh, prior to the U.S. election. Um, and of, like Evelyn, I would like to question, you know, this, this narrow, you know, effort. Uh, there have been elections in, in, in since 2016, and um, and I'm sure there could have been also lessons learned even for the U.S. election in those previous you know instances of elections out, outside of the U.S. And I think it's 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 important because like a lot of things on on platforms in general, we have seen um, both bad and good uses being you know first tried, tested outside of the US before or even outside of the EU, if we are to talk about, you know, the, the global north, um, there have been some, some, some case studies and practices that, that were rolled out before elsewhere, and we have seen the impact that they could have. So that's a little disappointment that I have uh, with many of the, of the policies um, uh, that have been rolled out, uh, because Obviously, like we've seen that there have, there have been lots of efforts. Uh, the platforms have been really, you know, rolling out policies every day almost, or at least once a week uh, since, uh, since uh, early this year. So, uh, but the DVL is definitely uh, into the details. And in many of, the, of these policies, the details will make the difference. Um, I will, I will share, share an example and uh, share two examples actually, to show the importance of, uh, especially when we're talking about global platforms. Uh, as a reminder, a platform like Facebook has 70% uh, of its users who are outside of the United States. That doesn't mean that you know, the United States is not important. Of course, it's super important. And you know, as I said, it, events in the US have uh, you know, important influence on what will happen to the rest of the world. But it's also interesting, again, to look at what's happening elsewhere in order to be better prepared. That's really the idea uh, that I'm trying to, to share here. And an example, and I hope it will also answer to one question that was uh, sent to the, to the panelists, sorry. Um, one of the example is this issue of early victory claims or false victory claims before uh, official results are out. This is a practice that has been widespread, especially on social media. I would even say, especially since social media are available in, in many parts of the world and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, it has become indeed a way for um, opposition candidates in environments where the electoral process is at the hands of you know, a powerful uh, president to kind of gain control uh, on, on, on the narrative and highlight uh, the, the, the potential irregularities that have, might have marred the, the process. But we, we, we see that, for instance, uh, platforms like um, 
I think Facebook, Instagram, uh, I can't remember the others, but some platforms have said that they wouldn't, um, you know, take down this type of, of, of speech um, because it doesn't violate their community standards and others have said they would take them down. I think Twitter has said it would take them down. Um, but it's interesting, for instance, could we have, you know, a sort of rationate temporary thought about this? Um, does it make a difference when the election results are out, you know? When you make a, a misled claim before the official results are out, I mean, there could be in good faith a mistake that has been made or, you know, <laughs> over enthusiasm. Let, let's be naive about things, right? Um, but obviously when the elections are out, probably the things change, the, the things are, the situation becomes uh, different, you know, when you continue to make claims, uh, despite the fact that official results have been put out, should, should there be a different reaction to this? Um, I, I'm not sure platforms have had this conversation, uh, but I think it would be interesting, you know, this rationally temporary, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, thinking around this. Uh, that was one example. The other example that I was hoping to, to mention here, although it's not, you know, directly related to the policy that have been recently rolled out, but I think it's an interesting, very interesting example to show how important it is to pay attention to details, especially the ones that are not in our direct focus. Um, it's the case of the Nancy Pelosi ma manipulated video. Um, you know, suddenly early 2019, we started having discussions in, uh, uh, in, in the US about, oh, not early 19, I think it was mid 2019 about what to do with uh, when you have this type of content and suddenly, you know, platforms woke up to the fact that, yes, people can share manipulated media on our platforms. But had the platforms paid a little bit attention, you know, outside and a bit far from, from Washington or from, uh, from the Silicon Valley, uh, they would have seen that there was a country in which discussion around a deep fake has had huge consequences of, uh, offline uh, and particularly uh, has caused the second coup attempt in the history of the country. And that country is, um, is Gabon, it's located in, in West Africa or Central Africa if, you, if you're a Francophone thinker like me. Um, th this country, yes, has witnessed uh, a coup attempt because a video aired on Facebook Live uh, a video address of the of the present air of uh, aired on Facebook Live did not convince people that it was you know really not ma manipulated and has uh, led to people within the entourage of the president staging a coup to you know protest against uh, these images. So, had the platforms again given a thought about or at least been open about this, probably they would have had this conversation even before the Nancy Pelosi case came out. So. Um, I, I think it's it's really important that we pass, um, yeah, I think we're at a maturity stage, I hope, for the platforms to think that we have passed this time where, you know, we are reactive and, you know, we we have to become very agitated with, when something big is going to happen in the US, because that's really the pattern, and or in the EU, for that matter. Um, but I think it's unfortunate, especially since many of these platforms are repeating all the time that they are global. Yes, you are global, uh, and uh, there has to be consequences to that globality. And one of these consequences is paying attention also to uh, uh, to your user who are uh, you know beyond the, the the frontiers, the borders of of the United States, of Canada, and other places in the world. But I'm focusing today on on the U.S. So uh, um, yes, these are some of some of the the thought that I was hoping to share. I'm just checking if I haven't forgotten anything. No, I haven't. And I haven't derailed the conversation. I'm so happy about it. Um, as a conclusion, I would say I completely agree uh, with Evelyn. There has been huge improvements uh, compared to if we had had this conversation in, in 2016. Uh, but the devil is definitely in the details and the operation, the actionability and the operationability of these new platforms that are, you know, rolled out in, yeah, in a kind of emergency mode could have 
could be better prepared and we could have you know information as to does it work or not if we were more innovative if we were if we also tested the good things you know the bad things are tested elsewhere in the world we've seen cambridge analytica it's very well i mean their test is one of, among the perfect ones but it would be interesting also to test the good things and see how how they yeah what what kind of impact they can have thank you Thank you, Julie. I, um, I want to ask a question of both of you. Um, you're both um, from outside of the US. Um, and so you have a, a more global perspective on content moderation issues. Um, I think after 2016, the platforms learned pretty quickly how to detect um, and deal with disinformation from foreign actors. But as we've seen over the past couple of weeks and certainly over the last couple of years, that is not necessarily the case when it comes to domestic disinformation, um, especially when the purveyor of that dis domestic disinformation is uh, within the US government, um, including at the highest levels of the US government. Um, do you think there are lessons learned when it comes to disinfo from elected officials um, that the US or that the US uh, can learn from? Um, um, bearing in mind the significant sort of public pressure um, platforms often come under for, for diff having to make difficult content moderation decisions. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Julie. Yes, um, well, it has always been a kind of criticism uh, against the platforms that they tend to have a heavier, no, they, they tend to apply their policies with more severity uh, when it comes to outside leaders and particularly leaders from southern global southern countries, you know, especially those that are not in very good terms with you no know, global north countries, including um, Iranian officials and, and Russian officials. Uh, and even on this issue of, of you know, uh, labeling of media control, uh, so sorry, state controlled media. Uh, we've seen that being rolled out against uh, many Russian um, state-owned, com uh, sorry, media companies. Uh, but honestly, the, the debate could also be had, we could also have this, this debate for many other uh, northern, northern media. Um, for instance, uh, I, I know a lot about France 24, which is the French um, state-funded uh, media. And that has that he's highly influential, especially uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Should they be labeled? That's a question, for instance, that we've received. So um, I, I think it's really also time that there is sort of more coherence and consistency uh, in order to prevent these platforms to be seen only uh, in some in, in some cases only as an arm for you know influence of northern uh, northern countries, uh, especially at a time when we know that there is this uh, split internet around, you know, this idea that the internet is going to be split between uh, those who will have a more controlled version of it, a la, a la Chinese version, or those that have a less controlled, although I don't know, probably that frontier is narrowing. <laughs> given the TikTok case, we don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, I think it's important to keep this in mind because the ultimate consequences, those platforms may end up being even blocked in, you know, these are the countries based on this uh, perceived inconsistency or at least less severity towards, you know, uh, governments uh, from Western, Western nation, nations and particularly the US. So. Yes, I think it's important to have this in mind. I don't have uh, a solution particularly on that, but I just wanted to bring this, this perspective. Thank you, thank you. Um, same question to Evelyn. Do you think there are lessons to be learned from other countries when it comes to dealing with disinformation from elected officials? So I think there's, there's two issues here. There's the, the, I mean, so the official position uh, of all platforms is basically we don't treat foreign or domestic disinformation any differently. Um, quite clearly, that's not the case. Um, there's sort of two types of buckets here. There's the disinformation of an elected official comes out and says something false. Uh, and that's sort of what I spent um, the most of the presentation talking about. And I mean, I think that um, I, I don't know that any country, like I don't think any platform does this particularly well in any country. I think that the, the my solution is 
is just apply the rule. Um, but the second, the second bucket is this sort of like the thing that I flagged earlier about like coordinated inauthentic behavior and this kind of like influence campaign that is not like someone comes out and says something that's disinformation, but the idea that some of the content may not even be particularly problematic, but it's being done in uh, non-transparent ways uh, to manipulate audiences and, and influence them. And I think this was an area where like I'd have a lot of problems with this, uh, this, this coordinated inauthentic behavior. And I think that it was an area where foreign speech was like scapegoated quite a lot. There was a lot of focus on foreign threats and, you know, the Russians are coming uh, kind of framing, uh, which distracted from, I think, a more fundamental question question of like what is what what are the appropriate standards of uh, coordination uh, online and uh, like activity like where do you draw the line between a legitimate political activism grassroots campaigning um, marketing behavior and something that just like steps over the line and is suddenly it trolls um, and I think that we sort of uh, fastened on the foreign part of that as a, as a nice sort of simple way of doing that. But then we're confronting more and more as domestic actors do a lot of things that sure look like what the IRA did in 2016. What do we do about that? And, and we don't have as like it, it, that, that the platforms get nervous, understandably, because then it becomes like they are getting involved in domestic politics. But I think they need to, you know, again, have have much more transparent rules and clearer standards because their platforms are the platforms that create the incentives to engage in this kind of behavior and reward that kind of behavior as well with the amplification and and the and uh, engagement that it, it it gives it so i think much more transparent standards and, and it's also on the rest of us like we need to have a much bigger societal conversation about like where do we want to draw the lines around online activism uh and what do we think is acceptable and what what is not and i think that you know fastening on the foreign part of that is not going to help us advance that conversation. Thanks so much. Okay, so we have a few audience questions coming through. The first one looks like it's for Evelyn. Um, can you talk a little bit about the efficacy of fact checking and sort of the way you talked about the efficacy of labeling? Does fact checking help to bolster confidence in the online information space or to sort of bolst um, confidence in nonpartisan official sources when it comes to elections? So again, like fact checking is another one of those ones that like feels good and is a great like intuitive answer to a lot of things and everyone really likes it. Who can be against fact checking? Well, apparently a lot of people, but but like in general and in theory, fact checking sounds great. Um, and you know, I, I I am in favor of it. I think it's I think it's really good and I think it's something where there should be a lot more resources. Uh, you know fact checkers are chronically under resourced, especially uh, in other parts of the world and in non-English speaking languages, uh, non-English speaking, <laughs> non-English languages. Um, and, and so there should be a lot more resources and support for those. Um, and I, I think I, I think that's very, very true. It is also true, uh, first, that we need, like there, there is research that shows that it works and it can correct uh, certain kinds of belief, but there is also research that shows it can have some counterintuitive uh, results. So for example, some research showing that if you apply fact checks to certain certain stuff and leave other stuff unfact check there's an implied truth effect that people think that something that isn't flagged uh, is more likely to be true just because it doesn't have a label attached which might not be the case at all it's just that the fact checkers haven't applied haven't checked that one uh, and in a world where there's like you know billions of claims and only so many fact checkers that's that's a that's a problem so um so so we need a lot more research about what works what kind of fact checks work uh, and ways to sort of triage the most important claims and things like that um but also you know i think it's another one of those things it's not going to be a panacea and it's not going to fix everything. Um, I was speaking to Maria Ressa recently, a journalist from the Philippines, um, who has been the, the subject and the target of a bunch of, uh, a lot of disinformation and trolling campaigns uh, with the most awful effects. Uh, but she runs a fact-checking partner with Facebook uh, in the Philippines. And I was asking her, like, why are you doing this? You know, Facebook's, and she's like, well, you know, it's better than nothing, but it is, um, and her phrase was, a thinking slow solution for a thinking fast world, right? Like it's a sort of very tiny piece of the, pro uh, the puzzle. And it's a good one, um, but we need much more sort of systemic change and thinking about things like friction and, and, and stuff like that um, if we're really going to tackle the, the bigger underlying problems. So as with everything in this space, uh, people, uh, uh, you know, we have so many problems, we're going to need so many solutions. There's not ever going to be one thing that fixes everything. Um, and I think that applies to fact checking as well. So in, in the vein of... Um implementing uh, interventions that are sort of more uh, scalable uh, globally. We have an audience question. And I'll post this to Julie first um, with the context that just last week, the opposition party in Guinea, a country in West Africa, claimed victory on Facebook and Twitter before official results had been announced. 
um, do you think that Facebook rules should be global? Is that practical and is that desirable? There should be principles. I think it's it, it's again uh, a, a question of clarity. You know, freedom of expression doesn't change suddenly depending where you are in the world. You know, the the the, the, the foundations, the principles are basically the same everywhere. But now, what is clearly missing, and and I think we haven't talking about talked about that that much, is yeah. the granularity you know, what is the context? We refer that to that a lot. And particularly on that issue of, um, of you know, uh, early victory claim, especially in authoritarian uh, regimes, it, 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 it would have a huge consequence if, you know, suddenly the platform decided to delete the tweet from an opposition leader who's trying to uh, bring in democracy, or at least who is, presenting himself or herself as, you know, a, a, a democratic alternative. Uh, rather, I think what's important to do, and it's something that is really dear to my heart and that I've been working on a lot while at the, at the Berkman Time, is you have the best expertise ever you will ever look for in, in those countries, the journalists, the human rights defenders, the, the yeah, the activists, the entire regime activists who also have made, have done investigations, including on, you know, potentially uh, rigged elections. So it, it's, it's really important and essential for these policies to be fully integrated into uh, um, a big ensemble in which, you know, the, the, the context will be able, would be at the disposal basically of these platforms. And that's not necessarily always the case or even when there is, uh, you know, a little channel of communication between these platforms and, and you know, local organizations and civil society experts. That, first of all, we don't really know how how the platforms are using whatever information they're receiving from this from these partnerships. I think it would be uh, essential. My, my organization, for instance, Antoine Sans Frontières, has had to do some some work with with platforms, all of them, not only Facebook. And we actually don't know how efficient our, 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 what we bring in is. We think it is because we see a difference on the field, but obviously we don't have the data, which obviously platforms have. Uh, it would be interesting to have that. So yes, I think it's part of, it's part of the equation. It should be part of the equation. And it's definitely one aspect of how efficient a policy is going to be is how integrated it is to the reality in which you're deploying it. Yeah. We've talked a lot about um, the limitations of interventions that we've already seen so far on uh, premature claims of victory, on labeling, on fact checking. Um, and one thing that's really emerged uh, through you know, conversations that I've had with both of you uh, over the course of the last several months um, is that a whole of society approach is really needed to, to tackle disinformation in a comprehensive way. Um, what are the roles of some of these, the other components, um, the other pieces of the puzzle, civil society groups, um, governments? Um, and I'll pose that question first to you, Julie. Yes, uh, governments have, and I would even say a primary role, uh, because this, the, the fight against disinformation is not just you know, a product of platforms. It's really a question of our democracies, of our human rights, of the rule of law. So. Um, and the, the primary responsible to make sure that we have all this is obviously the government. So it's the government's responsibility to make sure that the, the citizens um, have, you know, not only access to the information, but are able to um, read that information. I remember very well a program that was rolled out in high schools in France, which was quite efficient. Uh, it was uh, a program in which disinformation experts would go to these high schools and work with students for, I think, one tri uh, trimester, I think the word exists in English, one trimester trying to share with them some of the methodologies that you can use to, you know, doubt things. Basically, you know, it's a Cartesian country, so you have to doubt uh, when you receive the information. So yes, I think that the government has a role to play, but obviously, uh, uh, civil society organization are central. First of all, because we wouldn't have all this conversation if we didn't have civil society organization researchers who have been doing the work on alerting uh, about what we are seeing now. Nobody listened to them. Now it's become a big thing, thing fortunately, but 
uh, it's it's good to have them in in the in the loop as well. And I'll I'll give another very good example of that related to another subject that's not directly uh, unrelated to disinformation, which is hate speech. We've seen so many governments suddenly, uh, you know, waking up to this realization that you know people use platforms also to share very uh, offensive speech. So <laughs> they just suddenly decide to find platforms and think that platforms have to over censor. Uh, but in the, in the case of France, where uh, a, a similar legislation such as the one in Germany was adopted, uh, the constitutional judge basically said that, first of all, all these measures were not proportionate, were not necessary. There were other ways to deal with that uh, and including working with judiciary authorities in the countries to define these boundaries around, you know, hate and uh, valid speech, uh, but most importantly, uh, criticizing also that dialogue only between platforms and governments that leads to, to censorship, basically, and that's the risk. In my opinion, civil society is really, um, brings the, the balance, basically, uh, between all these two actors, these two set of actors, which, to my opinion, don't necessarily have freedom of expression uh, really at the core of their preoccupations all the time. Brilliant answer, thank you. Um, Evelyn, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, what can I add to that? I think that that's, uh, that's, that's great and Julie has the expertise there. So I really don't, don't, don't have much to add. Uh, add. And I, I mean, the only thing I'm gonna add, and it's, it's very small and I wanted to say that this is only a, like a slight uh, additional thing that should not take away from the importance of platforms doing far more and the importance of civil society and the absolute fundamental importance of governments just not like pervade disinformation. That's like, if we could all just not lie, that'd be a really good start. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think there is something that like we all can do as well. I think we all, you know, should play our part in this process as well. I'm always a little bit shocked and surprised by people who like are despairing about the state of the online ecosystem and then like smash the retweet button on Curious claims when when they when they like them uh, and I do think like uh, I, I, you know and I'm guilty of it too right like we see something and we and we want to um, we want to sort of endorse and signal with it and I think if we all sort of try and model uh, be the Twitter that you want to see in the world um, that's a, that's a good way of sort of uh, proceeding as well to like try and be good actors and particularly over the next sort of uh, week and, and 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 couple of weeks here in in America uh, to try and make sure you're checking things before you uh before you sort of spread them and amplify them uh is, is is a small thing that we can all do as well yeah yeah thank you um i have one final question for you both and i i want to just step back and think very very big picture you know we as at the time we're record, recording this uh making this recording we're about one week exactly one week out from november 3rd i don't know about you but i am very scared um to both of you, pick one platform um, and think about all of the worst case scenarios that have been uh, running through your mind over the past couple of weeks and months. Um, and think about what as one change of perspective, um, one intervention or one policy you wanna see the platforms adopt to sort of mitigate uh, what you've ascertained as you know, the worst case scenario in your mind. Um, and whoever would like to go first can jump in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so the first part of the question, the worst case scenario, um, I've been thinking about, you know, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, artificially generated video uh, showing voter rigging in a random, you know, um, how do you say that, uh, voting station. Um, yes, how, how do you treat such claim, uh, especially in, in a t before the, the official results have, been, have come out and um, yeah. And uh, what was the second part of the question? How, what's the best response to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the best response to that definitely, in my opinion, would be first of all, for platforms to be also connected with uh, local, you know, not, I, I'm not really familiar with, you know, the hierarchy, but the voting, I'm sure there are authorities, you know, gathering the votes for, for states and, and I don't I don't know what's the equivalent. It's a kind of electoral. Well, at the state level. Sorry? 
There's state and local election officials, election and Okay, thank you, state okay. local election officials. I think it would be, it would be, yes, one of the best case scenario to kind of be prepared to counter this as soon as it come, comes out, being in direct connection with those uh, officials and getting real time uh, results and information on how the, 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 the counting is, is going. Yeah, so maybe with like a link to the most authoritative nonpartisan source. Yes, yeah, directly, not you know the website only, but like internally directing between those two. Thank you. Okay, Evelyn, same question to you. One platform, one intervention that you'd like to see, and how it sort of um, allows us to avoid the worst case scenario. Okay, so I'm gonna give. I'm gonna answer it twice because I think the first, the first, I've already answered it the first time, which is like my simplest fix. The, the one thing I want is I want YouTube to have a policy about false early <laughs> claims of, of election victory. Like, I really hope I'm wrong about this, but the nightmare scenario that I'm seeing is that on November 3rd, some candidate, not naming any names, is gonna like just do a live stream of like, we won the election, everything's over, it's all great. Uh, and YouTube doesn't currently have a policy for doing doing anything about that. Um, so that's my one like very simple fix. That's what I want. That's my my one big ask. If I could rub a genie lamp and have a wish come out, that would, that would be it. So, but my other wish then is like, uh, for, for all of them. My, my question is really around enforcement and can they enforce these policies and are they confident that they can enforce them? And if they're not confident that they can enforce them effectively uh, enough or quickly enough, for example, labels on mis misleading information about voting and things like that, then what I would like to see them do is someone mentioned this in one of the questions or something uh, about like um, introducing uh, like a pre-review of, of, of posts or tweets. I don't want that across all platforms for every post. I think that would be an infringement of, uh, of, of freedom of expression. But if you have repeat offenders that repeatedly uh, breach rules and that they have a history of posting certain kind of misinformation and you're not confident that you can attach a label within you know, minutes or half an hour of that tweet or post going up, um, then I would introduce some sort of tripwire or pre-review policy for repeat offenders so that those labels can be effectively applied before they're seen by tens of thousands of people. Thank you. And for repeat offenders, those would uh, ideally include elected officials like the president yes. or other, you know, GOP elected officials. Yeah. Yep. Great. Well, that concludes my, my set of questions. I want to thank you both for uh, a really robust, comprehensive, and enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining. Thank you to those who submitted questions. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.